Let's talk about complex numbers. Why do electrical engineers use complex numbers? Complex numbers show up in Euler's relation. They also show up in the Fourier transform. And they also show up in AC circuit analysis with impedance. Let's start by understanding what the imaginary unit is. In essence, i is equal to the square root of negative 1. In double E, the convention is the letter j. A complex number can be represented by the expression below. The complex number z is set equal to the expression on the right, and consists of two parts. a is the real part of our complex number, and jb represents the imaginary component of our complex number. I want you to think of a complex number as a two-dimensional number. Looking at a familiar Cartesian plane, we can express a normal vector graphically by saying it is going three units in the i-hat direction and two units in the j-hat direction. Similarly, a complex number in this example can be interpreted as a vector from 0 to the point 3, 2 on a complex or Gaussian plane. We can now call the projection of our vector onto the real axis, A, and our projection onto the imaginary axis, B. Using standard trigonometry, we can label this angle theta and make a series of conclusions from our triangle. The vector has a magnitude length of r is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. A is equal to r cosine of theta, thus b is equal to r sine of theta. We also know that theta is equal to the inverse tangent of b over a. Taking a closer look at our triangle, we can use a and b to construct our complex number z in this form. Remembering the trigonometric values that we gave our lines a and b, we can substitute these values into our complex number and simplify. If you remember Euler's formula from the beginning, you can probably see that we can just replace our sine and cosine with e to the j theta. We then condense our complex number into this expression. It can also be written in this shorthand form. So now that we've come up with ways to define and manipulate complex numbers, let's take a look at each form. We first have our rectangular form. We also have a trigonometric form using sine and cosine. We then used Euler's formula to solve for this expression in our complex exponential form. The final form is our polar shorthand form using the angle symbol. All of these various forms are ways to express complex numbers, and each have their respective use depending on the context and situation. All of this classification for complex numbers is great and all, but why do we care as electrical engineers? You may have seen this symbol on a circuit schematic. This is a AC voltage source. A generic AC voltage source can be expressed by a V0 amplitude with a frequency omega. We can convert this into a polar trigonometric expression by adding our imaginary term. We can add this term because it has no physical meaning and doesn't affect the real voltage, but we will need it for the math ahead. Condensing the expression for our AC voltage source further, we can create another graph to show the real life application of our first graph. We then have our angle, omega theta, the max value of V, which is V naught, and its respective projections on the real and imaginary axes. So how does representing a sinusoidal voltage source as a complex exponential actually help us? Well, given the voltage of our generic case for an alternating source, we can use this voltage to find a complex expression for our current. Using Ohm's law, we just divide our complex exponential by the resistance. So, given our most used passive circuit components as shown above, we can solve for the current through a resistor. We can also solve for the current through a capacitor, as well as an inductor. I've completed the algebra and calculus in the expressions below for these values of current. Looking at our calculated expressions for current below, we can come to valuable conclusions about how current works in each of these components. There is no J coefficient in our current expression through a resistor. Therefore, we can conclude that the current is in phase with the voltage that I have in blue. Given the J term found in the capacitor equation, we can now conclude that current leads voltage in a capacitor. This is due to a capacitor's tendency to resist sudden change in voltage. We see that the exact opposite happens in an inductor. An inductor resists change in current, therefore the voltage must rise or fall first in order to create the desired change in current.
So now that we've gone over complex expressions for voltage and current, we can now learn about impedance. We use Ohm's law once again to derive the complex form of resistance for each circuit component. Taking our complex expressions for voltage, as well as current, we can come up with a value called impedance, often written as a Z. The X in our other expressions stands for capacitive reactance and inductive reactance, but they can be treated as impedances when solving an AC circuit. The expression above is AC Ohm's law, where our equation is frequency dependent. This makes sense given that inductors and capacitors are essentially frequency sensitive resistors. Thus, we can treat our impedances as we would treat resistors in a DC circuit. Using impedances for AC circuit analysis can take away the headache of differential equations. In this example, we have an RLC series circuit with an AC voltage source. Because these components are in series, we can label each of these components Z1, Z2, and Z3. Their respective values are now shown on screen. We can calculate the total impedance by adding Z1, Z2, and Z3 together. If we want to solve for current, all we have to do is plug our expressions into this equation in order to find our alternating current. Although the algebra may be tough, this method can be easier than solving systems of differential equations. Before the end of this video, I want to make another quick point about impedance. On our now familiar complex plane, we can see clearly that Z sub R is located only on the real axis and therefore has an angle of zero degrees. Taking a look at our capacitive reactants, the J in the denominator gives us a vector pointing downward. This means it has an angle of negative 90 degrees. Our inductor is not surprisingly the exact opposite. It features a J omega term in the numerator and its angle happens to be 90 degrees as shown. These expressions can tell us about how these components function given different frequencies. For an inductor, a large omega would act like an open circuit, while a very small omega would act like a short circuit. A resistor is not dependent on omega, therefore there is no change. For a capacitor, however, the omega in the denominator means a large omega acts like a short circuit, while a DC source or small omega would act like an open circuit. This frequency response information is unbelievably valuable. So whether we are working with super high frequencies as shown here, or maybe we're working with lower frequencies, we can use these components to control amplification and attenuation of certain frequencies. Now for a quick recap. We now see the value of using complex numbers to come up with general expressions for voltage, current, and resistance. These complex expressions give us intuition for how these principles operate. Complex impedances are of particular use in breaking down AC circuits, and they also give us more information about frequency response and possible filtering techniques.